Hello to everyone. Welcome back to Chasset to Sholi. I'm Megan Baker. I'm a research associate here in the Choctaw Nation Historic Preservation Department. Um, today we have Dr. Chip Richardson, who is the owner of the property um, of Choctaw Academy, the site of a boarding school that was funded um, by Choctaw Nation um, in the 1800s and was also run by the U.S. government. So he's working on um, trying to restore the school. Um, and so today we're going to hear about its current status and its significance in Choctaw history. Um, if you want to learn more about Choctaw Academy, aside from what we talk about here, our very first Choctaw Tisholi was actually about Choctaw Academy. And we had Dr. Christina Snyder. Um, you can find that on the Choctaw Nation YouTube page. Um, it will be there, so feel free to go take a look there. So today I am joined by um, Francine Lockbray, an independent researcher who is also part of our historic preservation research group. Um, and she's done a lot of kind of research um, on Choctaw Academy, trying to find building sites and all of that. And so she's been doing that for years. Um, and we also have Dr. Ian Thompson, our Tribal Historic Preservation Officer, and he will be guiding our kind of discussion today. So if anyone has any questions, feel free to add them in the chat or in the Q&A boxes. You can ask them whenever. And so I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Thompson. All right. Thank you, Megan. Uh, Dr. Chip, Francine, thank you guys for joining us today. I'm, I'm looking forward to our conversation. So you two are the experts. Oh, wonderful. So um, in this call today, you two are the experts on Choctaw Academy. So I'm, I've got some questions I'm going to ask just to kind of guide our conversation and topics to think about, but I, I defer to your expertise on the topic. So to begin with, um, as Megan mentioned, you know, we had a whole Tosholi speaker series presentation on Choctaw Academy, but for, you know, people joining us today that maybe didn't get to see that, uh, would you care to just give a, a little bit of a history of the Choctaw Academy, Francine or, or Dr. Chip? Okay, well, I can start. I was hoping you'd do that, Ian. <laughs> <laughs> um, it was apparently founded in eight, about 1818 by Dr. Colonel Richard Johnson, who was a political leader in Kentucky. The Choctaw Nation became involved in about 1825 and Peter Pitchlin, uh, subsequently took 20, 21 students to Kentucky. It's outside um, Georgetown, Kentucky and Great Crossings. And he took 21 students to start. It um, lasted through till 1845, I think, Ian, wasn't it about then? That I believe so, it's whatever it. Yeah, 45 to 48. Um, through In that period, many Choctaw students went through that school, spent time at that school. Peter Pitchlin, I found out, did spend about three months in classes, but that was about it. Other than that, he was more of a leader. Um, eventually, they adopted what was called the Lancastrian method of teaching, and that was where the older students would help mentor and tutor the younger students, which helped considerably with language barriers because most of the students who came did not speak English. Um, I had a personal connection with my, my great, great grandfather actually went to Choctaw Academy. His father sent him there in 1832. And we know this through a journal that he wrote in the 1850s. He kept a journal and wrote the story of his life, his biography, he calls it. And I was telling Megan, I. In looking over it yesterday, I realized that really, if he had not gone to Choctaw Academy for four years, he probably would have never had the capability to do that, plus um, do what he did for the Choctaw Nation in the future. And, you know, as an adult, uh, many of the boys became leaders, the leaders of the nation, and very involved in running of the nation, the schools. My great-great-grandfather became a trustee and administrator for some of the schools. He was asked to teach in the beginning, but he says the school was, there weren't enough students. So then he went on to work for the chief. So. Is that it? 
was that at Choctaw Academy that he was invited to teach? Yes, yes, it was. Mm -hmm. So, but um, but his journal was found. Um, a relative uh, donated it to the Oklahoma Historical Society, and I have always felt like it's very rare to find such an item for Native Americans. And um, he writes actually <laughs> brought my. Um, Bill Welge had sent it to me and I transcribed it in the early 80s. That was when I began looking for the Choctaw Academy. And um, because he writes, that's a sample of how he wrote on this side. I don't know if you can see it, this side of the page, and then I transcribed on that side. And he also used it for, um, he would write out his speeches and correspondence, and some of that is in this book, is in this journal. And then following that, his wife, his widow took over, but she mainly did um, business entries. And um, so it was, this is Thompson, <laughs> but it was really enlightening. And in it, he talks about, he was, um, visiting his father in 1831-32 and he was go he was heading home back home he was only 14 and heading back home with his brother brother-in-law and sister to his mother's and his father said he would like him to stay and if he stayed he wanted to send him to school and so he started home turned around and came back and as they had agreed he went he was sent to Kentucky to the school. And then like a lot of boys, um, he stayed there through the removal. And then when he graduated in 1836, he um, came back to Indian Territory. Now he says in here that he, he did, we know he had a very classical education, which is what they were giving the students, it was a very classical education. And we have three of his volumes of Shakespeare. Yeah. <laughs> so, and I sometimes look at them and think, this is a Native American in 18, early 1800s. And he was, he had a full set of Shakespeare volumes. But then he says in it that he came out as a shoemaker. And that was part of what happened in the mid thirties was they did start bringing in the trades more for the students to learn the trades, which was um, very mixed reaction to that. I think most of the parents wanted their children to have a classical education, feeling that was what they would need to help um, keep the nation its own country. And, um, that the trades they could learn more at home. But they brought in, I think, five trades and shoemaker, blacksmith, tailor. And then it kind of became a question as to what was being done with the clothing and the sale of the items. So that became controversial. And then, and I'll just mention it because I don't think it's ever been found, but I, um, have read about there being another site over at I think White Sulphur. Is that that's correct? That's correct, White Sulphur. But yes. I don't think they've been able to ever find any evidence of those buildings. You know, so um but a lot of the names that you hear in, in Choctaw history, those young men went through the academy and came out and were very influential in the Choctaw Nation. So. Yeah, I certainly sure. think it's positive how, you know, the nation was in the treaty period, but looking forward, they used the, the finances from the sale of land in order to do something that would help build sovereignty moving forward or maintain sovereignty. So that to me, that's one of the high points of the academy, one of the most important things. Dr. Chip, would, would you like to add more to the, the history that Francine gave us? Sure, I'll, I'll give you the kind of the, you know, the eye surgeon's 20,000 foot view, because I kind of discovered this from the outside, knowing nothing. Um, when I learned about the academy, 
um, I realized that this was um, a really unique um, educational facility simply because it was the first federally funded and secular um, school. Um, the natives had gone through many, many years of, of mission type education. And within that education, of course, I, I believe that they were you know, doing a lot of production of goods and services and being taken advantage of that way. Religion was being, you know, forced upon them. And I think it, by the 1820s, when a, a series of treaties were course formed that you mentioned, I think the Choctaws were the first nation to really understand that, you know, education was going to be the secret to, you know, survival. And they were tired of the, the mission type training. And so using the annuities from the sale of their lands, they said, look, we're going to set aside $6,000 a year. And now we, this is, this is what we want. And it was, um, the Academy is very unique. I think we talk about mission schools sometimes and we, um, and, and rightfully so, I think a lot of mission schools uh, were, were not in the best interest of the Native Americans, but the Choctaw Academy, because it was truly an invention, um, or at least at the request of the Choctaw Nation, uh, was done right, it was done effectively. And I think that uh, when you look at the overall impact, um, I mean, it, it was enormous. We're talking uh, from 1825 to about 1843, 600 Native American boys from, from about 17 uh, different tribes uh, went to school there. I mean, the impression that that left upon uh, civilizations uh, is, is immense. And of course, um, something I recently discovered is, is three of the Choctaw boys, uh, or I should say three of the graduates ended up right here at a university here in central Kentucky, Transylvania University. Um, you know, I think one became a doctor, one became a lawyer, and one stayed and taught. I mean, this is this is uh, uh, such an empowering place. It's such, it's such an empowering story. Um, when I learned about it for the first time, I was like, wow, I feel like I was really kind of rediscovering uh, a critical part of American history. And then I met Christina Snyder. And after reading her book, I realized that now the Choctaw Academy was likely the most important place in antebellum America. I mean, it was the epicenter of the West. I mean, you know, Georgetown, Kentucky, Scott County, this was the epicenter, this was the frontier. Um, so much so that um, James Monroe, President Monroe brought uh, Marquis de Lafayette here in 1825. Uh, and of course, you know, an opportunity wasn't missed to, to share the school with the, the Marquis. And um, it really, really was that the Choctaw Academy, in my opinion, was um, probably one of the most impactful um, intersections of race um, and, and it, it kind of explored all the different uh, anxieties that people had at the time. Um, just the most progressive place in antebellum America. I mean, the Choctaw Academy is it. Thank you. You know, I, I obviously heard about Choctaw Academy, you know, studying Choctaw history. To my knowledge, it's the oldest stand, still standing building associated with Choctaw history pretty significant in terms of that as well. You know, I, I believe we first crossed paths maybe back in 2012 or so, uh, Dr. Chip. Yep. And, you know, at that time, the academy had slowly been <clears throat> deteriorating, obviously, the, the remaining building that's there on your land for quite a number of years, and you were reaching out for assistance on it. I, I remember sometime maybe 2016 or so, you know, our office reviews 3,000 federal undertakings per year to make sure that they don't damage Choctaw historic properties. And it, it happened that there was a cell tower there within the view shed. And memory serves me correctly, we weren't able to get the cell tower taken out, but we were able to get it lowered and get a light taken off of it, I believe. And then we, you know, we've, we've tried to partner in other ways too, uh, to preserve it. But what I'd like to ask you is, you know, how did you first become aware of the academy and, you know, how, how long have you owned the property and um, just interested in, in the personal connections that you have with it. Okay. So in 2012, my wife and I were looking for land near my office where we could eventually um, build a home and, and, you know, live peacefully, you know, now and forever. And uh, I discovered the Choctaw Academy during that search. There was this old dry lay stone, uh, you know, three-story structure sitting on this serene piece of central Kentucky bluegrass. 
And um, the, the owner of the farm actually had quite a good recollection of the story of the place. And the more I started to, to learn about it, the more I realized that maybe not only buying this piece of land uh, to live on is, is my calling, maybe helping to tell this story is also my calling. Um, my parents, uh, when, when I was very young, my, my dad reenacted the American Revolution um, and living history was, was always a part of my childhood. And I, this, this tied in almost too well to, you know, the, the, um, the post-revolution era and it really, really piqued my interest. So I bought the parcel in 2012 and at the time, the, um, the, the only structures that were remaining on it were the foundation of the original plantation dormitory, which is the, the standing structure that you see today. Um, and I believe the foundation of uh, the schoolhouse is still there as well. Um, I contacted, as you, as you mentioned, I contacted uh, um, the Choctaw Nation, uh, specifically the foundation, and I got in touch with uh, Seth Fairchild. Um, because I realized initially that about six months in that this this apical roof structure was going to collapse and it did. And at that point, you know, we were scrambling to try to figure out how to shore up the walls and keep the water out of the inside. And um, through the gracious help of Seth and the foundation, uh, a GoFundMe operation, I was able to, um, to to start that process. But I know we're going to talk a little bit more about that in a little bit, but my my discovery was by sheer happenstance. And I literally thought I had just hit the lottery and, and discovered, you know, some underwater, you know, you know, nation. It, it just was something that I couldn't even wrap my head around. How is it that something this profound had essentially become forgotten? Uh, and at that point I was hooked. Um, I was all in whatever it took to, to help preserve it. I, I was committed. Yeah, and I'm I'm glad that it was you that happened to come upon it there as a landowner. Yeah, and I'm I'm thankful for my parents for instilling that respect of history within me. Um, couldn't ask for better parents that way. I was going to comment that other than the landowner, we started looking for the location in the early '80s. And it was a real adventure because our son was young and he was being dragged all over that area until we could actually find someone who could give us vague directions to where there might be this building we were looking for. And um, at the time there was a dirt road actually going down to the house where the house and the building were. The next time there wasn't. So then I had, we had to, find it all over again. And we were kept getting led to this one woman, Ann Bevins, or Blevins, and um, she never was available. And I would feel she's probably not alive. She seemed to know, the seemed to be what everybody said was the one who would know about it. But we went, <laughs> the first visit, when we finally did get to the building, we met the lady and I think it was Mrs. Gaines and had quite a conversation with her. And I subsequently got some newspaper articles and, but then each time it was like an adventure until that last time, Chip, when we met the county historian. Yeah. And he was, all of a sudden there was someone who could show us where it was and talk with us about it. You know. Yeah. So believe it or not, Ann Bevins is is our is uh, our our oldest running um, county depot of information. She she just finished college, believe it or not, uh, in her eighties. Um, but Ann Bevins um, has written a series of books about the history of uh, Scott County that are in our in our museum. And I encourage you when you come back to take a look. But Ann Bevins is is still. Uh, our, my point contact person, if I ever need to know about a historic structure anywhere in this county. So she, she's still with us and she, her brain sharp as a tack. I was, because I kept getting this feeling from everybody I would talk to that she was, you know, an elder, by my age lady, but, and we were young at that time, but um, we never did meet her, never did find her, but I have her articles that she wrote you know, about the academy 
and yeah. um, and refound them again this last week. But um, and, you know, so someday I hope I would hope to meet her. <laughs> yeah, she uh, she was the one that actually did the original I think 1975 uh, application to put it on the register, the National Historic Register. Okay. That's all her work, yeah. But it was amazing how few people. It, whether it was that they just didn't want to talk about it or send people onto private property, but we get these blank looks, you know. And one time we were sent to the guy who owns William Ward's house, that house, and he helped us. And then what my sister and I, when we went, when I took her there, because I felt it was important enough to our heritage for her to see it if we were in the area and um we ended up at great crossings with the sheriff <laughs> so, and he was yeah. wonderful he knew who to call to find out where it was but even he didn't know exactly where it was so it's been your hidden treasure in in the georgetown great crossing scott county kentucky yeah absolutely and you obviously were the person meant to own it <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, and uh, you know, my experience was similar to yours, Francine. The first time I went out there to that area, I was with the local, and she offered to take me to the academy site. And we drove around the countryside for three, four hours, and never yes. located the property. Went on back. It would be a few more years before I, I was able to actually see it. But yeah. I, I know what you mean. That was yeah. The first time we found the historical marker, but then we, as we read it, we said, "This." There isn't anything here. This is where Johnson lived. It's not where the, you know, and then when you read it carefully, it says, well, a mile or so down the road. So we kept, we finally got smart the last second to the last time and took, well, my sister and I took pictures. We actually took pictures of every road crossing <laughs> so that if we ever were able to return, we knew where it was. <laughs> you know, so. So it's quite an adventure, but it's worth seeing. It really is. And I hate to see it in the condition it is in. Because when I first saw it in the early 80s, it was the pictures. I think you probably have them. You all probably, I don't you all have them. Um, you know, it still was, it was very beautiful for its age and everything. I consider it was very beautiful because it was over, well over 150 years old at that point. Yeah, and now it's 200 years old. Yeah, it's 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 actually remarkable uh, that the walls uh, are as true as they are today. Um, it's it's got very good bones still. So, so Dr. Chip, would you like to tell us about you know the current status of, of the building there, what it looks like right now? Sure. So, um, in 2017, like I, I mentioned earlier, with the help of the foundation. The Chada Foundation. I was able to um, work with a local contractor and get a, a roof put over the entire building. Um, that's kept the moisture out of the inside, except when it's a real, you know, laterally blowing rain. Um, the current condition is basically the way it was in probably mid 2012 after the roof collapsed. Uh, maybe a couple more stones have fallen out of the south wall, but there, it's really about the, the same as it was then. Um, the as I mentioned earlier, the apical roof structure, um, there was no triangulation in the roof design. So when we lost the, the apical beam, basically it, it pushed the, the south wall out kind of like a, a wishbone would. And we lost a lot of stones in the south wall. The, the north wall is still very much true. Um, but that's uh, the way you saw it in 2017, 18, uh, 2018 is, is very much the way it is uh, right now. Um, it, uh, the walls are very true. Um, the interior, you know, wood is still in good shape. We have good floor joists on the on the first story and the second story. Um, because of the rain that would that infiltrated it, you know, even the, the roof was leaking well before I purchased it. But that moisture took its toll on some of the the plaster and batting that was on the inside. Um, but you know, the fire the fireplaces are still there. The the stone floor in the basement uh, is still intact. Um, but its current status is is the, the roof, the temporary roof that the foundation helped helped me build, um, has really saved the place. At least put it in a, a little bit of a cocoon so we can uh, continue to you know mount a plan for the future. 
So we, I know that you had some some images that you wanted to share. Would you like to do that at this point or a little bit later? Sure. Well, I can. I, I want to. You know, since we're kind of in the the intro phase of of why is Choctaw Academy so important, I just wanted to share a couple of things real quick. Uh, you know, when you when you pick up a textbook, uh, you know, schools in the Choctaw Nation or schools for the Choctaw, um, you learn a lot of. Uh, a lot of things, and you know, here's a here's a perfect example. The Choctaw did a vast amount of good. The best men uh, we saw in the nation had received their education, and uh, and this is an opinion from the early, uh, uh, I guess, mid 1800s. Um, and then we go. I can get this thing to lock out here. And we go into uh, Christina's book, Christina Snyder's book. And you'll see, you know, the story of great crossings reflects in microcosm large scale forces shaping, you know, North America. But it, it, it animated those changes. And then in the next paragraph, she goes on to state great crossing provides an intimate view of the ambitions and struggles of Indian settlers and slaves who came together at a crossroads and tried to forge paths ahead. Um, I, I mean, you could not you could not possibly describe the place in any more succinct way than Christina did. It was a place where. Not only Native Americans, local whites, Richard Mentor, of course, had a, a, a mixed racial marriage. Uh, his his uh, African daughters uh, learned there from the schoolmaster after hours. I mean, just an absolute gem of a place in terms of the, the progressive things that were going on there. Richard Mentor truly believed that it wasn't the color of one's skin that determined their ability, that you know, education could be bestowed upon anyone. Um, he was known for emancipating uh, slaves, uh, his his wife's relatives. Um, it's just, uh, I, I think he was a special man, and that was certainly a special place. Um, but the picture uh, that I really wanted to show was when we all met together uh, in 2018. Uh, well, actually, there's one more. There's one more book that was written in 1990. One of the most remarkable institutions in the history of American higher American Indian higher education was the Choctaw Academy. Next paragraph for 20 years, it was the most significant educational institution for Indians. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. It even speaks to Thomas and Thomas uh, Henderson's devotion to the interests of the Indian boy. You know, I truly believe that Thomas Henderson was the machine that made that education work. But then with the Choctaw Nation's interest and I started to get on a roll. I put together a big, maybe it was in 2018, and this is the picture I'm really proud of. Um, when you can see in the background the, the the roof structure that's built over it, and of course it's it's not touching the structure at all. So there's no load, there's no there's no weight, there's no you know forces whatsoever on the building. But as we go around the circle here, um, I mean you can obviously Ian, you see yourself there, um, Seth. Uh, in the red shirt, we had Dryley Stone Conservancy, and Bevins is actually on the far left here with the camera on her hip, um, the, the Scott County historian. We had uh, a commercial, the, the RCI Corporation and their uh, president, um, and uh, a couple of folks from their foundation, their, their CEO, um, and then we had historic architects, uh, more Dryley Stone Conservancy. We had the, the Kentucky Humanities Council. We had the Kentucky Heritage Council. Um, Christina Snyder, and even a representative from Congressman Andy Barr's office. I mean, I was able to assemble all these people in one place, and we had a big meeting at our local library to figure out what we're doing with the Choctaw Academy. Um, and so much good spurred from this event um, that we're still kind of riding the wave of, of what was accomplished here. Wonderful. So, would you would you be willing to update us on on how things have moved along since that picture was taken, since that meeting? Sure. So, um, obviously, you know, we started with a little GoFundMe page. We were able to get some matching funds with the foundation to build the roof structure. Um, the local elementary, Stamping Ground Elementary, their fifth grade class did almost a year long project about the academy. Um, we did. We made a film. We made a short film using students as narrators. Um, they raised five hundred dollars, which we ended up putting towards uh, shoring the floors. I didn't want to take any chances with the building, so we actually had a structural engineering company come in and we we shored up the floors. So the the ground is shored to the first floor joist, and then the first floor is then shored to the second floor joist, so that the floors um, are stable. So we prevent an implosion 
event. Um, so, so that was done and that was done in the middle of probably one of the coldest days in the history of Kentucky. And I commend the guys that, that did that. Um, and then subsequent to that, we moved on to, um, you know, raising money for a, a documentary, uh, the RCI corporation, which is now called IBEC, um, helped put together a, um, historic inventory and architectural inventory. So uh, like with any good preservation project, you want to start with, you know, what do you have? So we did LIDAR scanning and RCI helped fund that. Um, and then subsequent to that, uh, we signed a, a memorandum of understanding with the RCI Foundation, um, which of course is a is an organization of roofing contractors. Uh, and the, the understanding was that over the next two years, RCI would raise about $300,000 capital um, to basically restore the entire structure. Um, we uh, would, the, the plan was obviously at that point to let RCI do its thing, um, you know, you know, lobby industry, you know, raise the money. Uh, what was really, I think, kind of a setback at that point in the timeline was RCI went through a leadership change. Uh, their previous president, who was um, from Africa, um, who, you know, had seen apartheid firsthand, who recognized immediately how empowering the academy had become. Um, was gone now. And I noticed that when I was watching the little thermometer on their website that the fundraising had kind of hit a point and then it stopped. Um, I, you know, of course, made multiple inquiries and, and um, you know, no one, everyone was kind of keeping their cards a little bit close. But my understanding was that somewhere along the way, um, the RCI leadership was, was kind of got the, the impression that boarding schools were bad which I think if you look at a lot of boarding schools, they were bad. Um, but as I pointed out in, in a lot of the text that I just shared with everyone, this boarding school, although perhaps mismanaged uh, to some degree at, towards the end, which is what ultimately caused it to falter, um, this boarding school was different. Um, and I think there was this tendency to um, kind of follow the masses on, on just an overall impression of what, what is a Native American boarding school and RCI eventually just said they didn't want to be involved anymore. Um, I feel like I lost kind of a, a year and a half of, of, of the timeline, you know, in terms of my ability to uh, do some independent fundraising. Uh, I mean, I raised $17,000 on my own in the lead. Um, I mean, just between patients that come into my office and, and just getting the word out. I mean, people were writing checks, magistrates. Um, you know, the, the executive branch of our local government. I mean, everyone was getting involved, but then when RCI got involved, I had to kind of set back and let them do their thing. So, you know, you're, you're kind of pulling at my heartstrings here a little bit because what, what happened next was to me, it was almost, it was, it was almost Armageddon because I had, um, after RCI got involved, I realized right away that the only way this foundation was going to be able to put money into the structure was if the structure was held by a nonprofit in some way. And so I looked at, you know, of course, granting it to the to the nation. Um, and I didn't feel like there was a lot of interest in that because it was outside of, of Oklahoma. So I got really creative and I talked to a real estate lawyer and I said, what if I granted a, a, an easement, an access easement, essentially to the exterior of the building. You know, the interior is, is, is unsafe until we do the restoration, but the exterior of the building. And what if I gave that easement to the local museum whose operating guideline states, you know, preservation of artifacts? I mean, it's per, it's, it doesn't say the artifact has to be in the wall of the museum. So we got the local, uh, you know, uh, county judge uh, involved and we drafted up an easement. And so, so then what happened was now I had this beautiful mechanism where foundation monies could, and this is RCI foundation monies could actually restoration. And that wouldn't be any kind of an IRS violation because it would be for the benefit of the, of the museum. And of course we had a process by which the museum would have it open to the public. And there was, you know, a lot of things in that regard that were in place, but in the background of this whole RCI thing, I had a relationship with one of the uh, uh, humanities 501s in, in Kentucky, and they were actually my kind of the, the project's fiscal agent. Um, RCI didn't want to um, 
essentially, you know, write the checks for, for the restoration or the documentary. So RCI funds were essentially going to go into this, this, this 501, this humanities group in Kentucky. Well, when RCI pulled out, um, the humanities group started to get a little bit of cold feet. And one day in 2020, they put together a meeting and they said, Dr. Richardson, we really need you to come over here to the public library because we need to talk to you about this project. And next thing I know, they said, we have, you know, the balance of what RCI raised at the time, it was only like $2,000 over and above what they spent on the, on the uh, LIDAR and the, in, in the historic inventory. We have that plus your money and we're going to give it to the, the uh, documentary producer because we want to divest ourselves of the project. And now I'm sitting here and my heart is breaking, right? Because I had developed kind of utopic preservation plan and I had all the pieces and parts in place. And now it was crumbling around me. And of course, as you, as you can recall, Ian, the same thing that uh, was happening at the same time, actually, in, in the timeline of, of American history was, was there was this, this kind of push against things that were related to white colonialism, right? And so, you know, statues were coming down. And I think, you know, we were losing touch, uh, we're really, really losing touch with the kind of the, the, the social paradigms that were present at the time that Richard Mentor Johnson was alive. You know, you can't take everything that we want to memorialize in the United States and have it be 100%, you know, pure or maybe live up to, to today's you know, moral litmus test. And it's the same thing goes true to every bit of history in the United States. It's not perfect. History is never intended to be perfect. You know, the history of the Choctaw Academy is a, is a beautiful story that talks about, you know, integration and empowerment and, 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 and the importance of education. And we are, we, I felt like it was that this whole thing was falling away from me because um, places and companies we're getting nervous about being affiliated with something that could be potentially affiliated with white colonialism. And that's me speculating. No one actually ever came out, but that's the only way I could explain because it was happening to me on the coattails of a lot of American history being torn down from the public eye. So moving forward, um, you know, all of the monies that I had raised to that point which was always, you know, meant for documentary plus restoration and then moved into the documentary phase. So Michael Breeding Media, which is a Lexington based, uh, Lexington, Kentucky based operation is um, currently uh, at the point where we have a, a, a script and, and he, of course, has a lot of the media ready to, to do an hour long, you know, production quality, uh, you know, national broadcast quality production um, about the Choctaw Academy. And that's where I am right now. Sadly, I've had to put um, because of I hate to even call it cancel culture, but I, I truly believe that this project, I feel like it's been canceled um, as, as far as the physical restoration. Because of that, I've had to put the hopes of a physical restoration uh, kind of aside until Americans start to get their wits about them and realize that American history, it is not perfect. Um, and we can't be putting our own you know, biases and prejudices uh, against those you know, 200 years ago and expect them to, to live to the same moral standard. Um, history is exactly that, it's history. And for right now, uh, we're working on this documentary. I hope to someday find an angel who's strong and powerful, who will look at the Choctaw Academy for what it is um, and help me tell the story, not only with the, with the video, but tell the story by giving a place where people can go and reflect upon um, those trials and tribulations of all of the various races that collided on the frontier in 1825. Yeah, you know, it certainly comes from a, a period. I, I don't know if any period is necessarily more, more difficult than any other in the human experience, but it certainly comes from a, a period when there were a lot of different things happening that were not necessarily beneficial for everybody, and it's tied up in that. But as you say, it's also part of a, a good story, too, at least from Choctaw Nation's perspective. Yeah, the very fact the very fact that the the the, un, the union between the nation, you know, my project, if you will, is still a sound union, should dispel any concern anyone potentially would ever have about the place.
politics because it's your story. It's not my story. It's my American history, but it's truly the story of the Choctaw Nation. And no matter what anyone would say about it, as long as the nation shows interest, that's all that's important to me. You will never, ever snuff the fire of the, the flame of my passion to help get this thing restored as long as the nation considers this an integral part of their history. And I'm, I'm in 100%. Well, we, we certainly appreciate and respect your interest in, in preserving it in the building and getting the story out there. Yeah, I, I wish I had a, I wish I had a, you know, awesome story to, to, to share about how we brought, you know, the timber carpenter in and the roof has been restored and we found someone to hand make us some cedar shakes for the roof or oak shakes if it, as they may have been and, and, you know, get it back to the, to the image that, that Francine recalls. Um, but we're, we're going to, we're going to try so hard to get this documentary out. Hopefully it'll get picked up by a PBS outlet. Um, and then, like I said, hopefully we can find an angel to help us uh, tread, you know, just trudge forward to, to, to the, uh, the final completion, which is the story and saving the place. So you, you'd mentioned the preservation easement earlier, you know, what would your vision be for, for site visitation? Say that, you know, that, Eventually it is restored. Eventually it is safe for people to look at. What would be your ultimate goal for site visitation? So the, the way we penned it was, um, you know, obviously have it open to the public during various times during Native American History Month. Um, and then, you know, where there was one other time during the year and then other times, you know, upon agreement of both parties, that was just the initial initial sketch. But the way I envisioned it, because as Francine can tell you, it's uh, it's not the easiest thing to get to, and there's certainly you know not you know copious parking. Um, I have access uh, you know along the driveway. Uh, it's it's an easement as well, but I have access you know for the purpose of, of visitation uh, and view. And so I would hope that my future plan would be the museum on certain days of the year have their patrons, the patrons you know maybe you know spend five dollars or whatever, and we take a van to the Choctaw Academy you know a couple times three, four times during the day. And then, uh, you know, if I need to be the docent, I will, but, you know, tell the story, um, bring the, bring the museum patrons. There's a great little display at our Scott County museum about the Choctaw Academy. I think one of the original school bells is there. Um, but it's, uh, it, the view is of course, allow the museum to take, um, uh, to take an interest in the place and use it as a, as a way to drive, uh, patrons to the museum. And that that's good. Obviously, part of keeping a place alive, keeping a structure alive is continuing a use and that that would obviously be a use and connect different publics with it. Yeah, right now, unfortunately, you know, it, it's a, um, it, it's a, it's a hazard with, with the water that infiltrated the, some of the uh, ash flooring, you know, you wouldn't obviously want to walk inside of it at this point. Um, we, we just, we either need to be all in or, or, or all out. And you know, surrender to, to current culture, but I, I, I would like to think that someday a door will open and we can get all in again. I think, um, if I can put, you know, the success story of it, the, is the young men that came out of that school, you know, for all tribes that went there, I think, and there were what a dozen tribes, at least even from the North. That was to me so surprising when I had learned that, that all of them became really contributing um, adults to their nations, to their different nations and to the United States. Like you said, the one young man remained as a teacher. And I think um, Trahern was the one that became the doctor. No, he was the one that was the doctor. <laughs> um came and served for a time at the academy you know these men obviously got a good education and my ancestor states that he had gone to school one of the mission schools but all he could do at the age of 14 was barely read and write and couldn't speak a word of english and four years later he's competent enough to um teach back in the in the indian territory and become a trustee and administrator for the schools in Indian territories. You know, so, um, so they were success stories. 
Yeah, I mean, Richard Mentor is very proud of, of the Native American boys. I mean, every year there was an annual display. Um, of course, the most famous of which I think was the one that uh, hosted Marquis de Lafayette, where, where the boys were reciting Cicero. Um, Richard Mentor's uh, uh, African daughters were, um, you know, playing the piano and singing and dancing, and they, you know, had multiple spits with, you know, you know, hundreds of pounds of beef and 500 pounds of cheese. And, you know, it, it's the, the, the I, I just can't, it, when you stand on the place and you look at the rolling hills and you imagine the stories from the early 1800s, you just are taken back about how important that place was and the people that visited and how it was a lot of hopes and, and dreams for future America were resting there. It's just an amazing piece of history. It is. And it provides an opportunity. You know, one of the beautiful things about the past is, is learning from the past, learning from past successes and mistakes. And, you know, so many different things meet at that crossroads that it's an opportunity to do that that's, that's not reflected in a lot of other stories. So, I, so yeah. I think. Most so just to bring you totally up to the last minute, um, there was a um, another uh, historic preservation minded group, a 501 in Kentucky, that in 2011, uh, it might have been 12 or 13, put the academy on the 10 most endangered you know pr properties in in uh, Kentucky, and um, I had uh, asked them to uh, kind of help resume as being my fiscal agent for at least the documentary. You know, just to try to keep that momentum going, because we'd like to have a great narrator. I mean, I'd love to have a great, you know, famous Native American narrator for the documentary. And obviously those those aren't cheap. And um, I would love to go to raise a little bit more money and, and get, uh, you know, just a rock star narrator. Uh, but that's where we are right now. We're trying to put something together um, to have them carry on as my fiscal agent. Um, I don't want to, we, we've talked about this. I don't want to try to start a 501 myself. I mean, it would take six months to probably even get it through the IRS, um, you know, just to have something. There, there are a lot of 501s that can help us here. And I just don't feel like starting one myself is the right thing to do, nor would I even know where to start to ask people to, you know, serve forever. Um, but we'll get there, Ian. I, I think at least on the document, we get there. Um, but hopefully with this awareness that, that you're, um providing uh, on the on the nation's website we'll hopefully find you know an angel uh, that can help us uh, take the restoration to the finish well again thank you for your commitment to preserving that place and its story and, and for sharing it with us it's my pleasure it's my pleasure and francine that's good to see you again yeah good to and see I, you i always um, think about yeah, I was going to mention in looking through some of my old articles and Ann Bivens, I think there's more than um, possibly more than one picture of the Academy. She has in one of her art, you know, there's the long one with yeah. the five buildings that's in the yeah. museum and yeah. it's a glass, uh, real early 1905, I think. And John Hawkinsmith, as far as I know, is who owns those that. Yeah, I have a copy of this, actually. Right. Well, in these articles that I was looking over, um, she has a picture of another one, another building, a warehouse that was back by the stream and by the spring. And I thought, you know, it might be worth your while, too, to see if what Hawkinsmith does have, you know, if he has all of that photographer's glass plates. Or if well, I'll, I can share. I have the picture of that. That uh, well, there was Julia Chin, who was the de facto um, wife of Richard Mentor, lived in this house, which is just you know maybe fifty yards away from the Choctaw Academy, and yeah. that's that's down towards the stream. Uh -huh. And then um, there, there was a um, there was another. Um, structure, if you will, a spring house that was also close to um, the bottom of the hill there that I, th I think maybe that's what you're referring to. Was it a spring house, do you think? 
because there was this building. House, but it was near the spring. Yeah, this, this is the spring house. Could be it, yeah. Mm -hmm. I had never, you know, it had been so long since I'd looked at the articles, I hadn't noticed that picture until just the other day. And, uh, and I thought. But check out this great, uh, this great image. So you can see in the distance, um, that timber structure that's behind the dormitory, which has got the two very wide kind of horizontal windows at the bottom. Um, judging by the descriptions, I think that that's still there today. It's, it's used as kind of a warehouse for farming operation, but um, really? that actually might have been where this the original school build, the school uh, house was, is that white building that's behind the dormitory there in the picture. I'll be darned. Hmm. Yeah, it's still there. It's kind of covered in some some shrubs. It's not on my parcel, but I believe that might have actually been the original schoolhouse. I'll be darned. So there are still more structures than just the one. Yep, absolutely. In better. Uh, yeah. Uh, Dr. Chip, re refresh my memory. Wasn't there another building <clears throat> very similar to the dormitory originally? And isn't that where the teacher stayed? And wasn't there a classroom in there? Yeah, so um, I wish I had I wish I had taken a picture of that uh, that Bradley photograph that uh, Francine is is referring to. But yes, there were there were two buildings that were adjacent to the Choctaw Academy, um, and and this will give you perspective here. So here's a here's an 80, 1980s picture of the Choctaw Academy, and on the right hand side, um, inside this stone wall, were were two buildings. One was I think one story, and another one was two stories. And that two story structure was where the the schoolmaster lived, and I think there was also some some teaching or or uh, living that was that was uh, done there as well. Um, but just look at the, I mean, look at the Choctaw Academy. I mean, think about it. At that point, that thing was nearly two hundred years old, and look how straight it is. Actually, when we were there the first time, we probably could have walked in, but we because um, that was early eighties, and that's possibly a picture I took. Um, but because even for the Oklahoma Historical Society, the pictures I took when we vis first visited were the only ones that they have had, you know, for that those early pictures like that. But, but here's we, a here's a here's a here's the sad perspective. Um, this was after the South Wall collapse when the when the roof came down, and this is the. Um, the, the uh, timber carpenters putting up the pole barn structure, which you can see, um, you know, the roof's gone, obviously, and the and the about half of that south wall, the second story is gone. All the material, of course, is there, but it's uh, it just was pushed out when the roof collapsed. So yeah, that's it's Ian. It's it's still very much the way you saw it uh, with the with the protective roof. Um, but I fear, you know, you, you obviously still can't keep the, the rodents and the moisture out 100%. I mean, at some point, we're going to potentially lose the floor joist, which is the, you know, the endoskeleton of the building. And, you know, it, 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 it's not going to wait forever. Um, but certainly, at least I've slowed down the, the deterioration. Well, at this point, let, let's shift it back to Megan and she can uh, read some of the questions that have come in for us. Okay, cool. Um, we actually don't have any questions. Um, he, oh, just kidding. There is one. Uh, or someone uh, thanks you for your work and the update, um, and they'll continue to follow. Okay, we have one question that's going to come in soon. All right, Catherine, go ahead and write your question. <laughs> we'll just wait for that. Is someone still living in the house that's right by there? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. That uh, that is a relative of uh, of Susan Gaines, who you met when you were there. Okay. Okay. Yeah, he's he's still there. Uh, a wealth of information. Uh, just yeah. a wealth of information the the story of the academy was clearly passed down in his family and, and he knows an awful lot about it so 
Uh, All right, I see some combo forming here on a question. Yes, we're waiting for Catherine to go ahead and ask her question. Go ahead and type that in, Catherine. Yeah, go yes. you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, I thought you wanted to ask the question. <laughs> no, I was reading what she said. <laughs> If I was going to say, if people want to know more about it, there is a lot. If you do a Google search, I think you can find there are a lot of articles and um, they're part of a lot of writings. It's part of a lot of writings, especially yeah. the Chronicles. The Chronicles of Oklahoma and Muriel Wright did a lot of writing about it. So, so Francine, that's, that's a really good point. It was a federal project. Um, yes. I spent an entire day in the National Archives in D.C. Um, looking at original documents, you know, with the prototypic white gloves. Um, and it's amazing what's been written about the Academy, the finances of the Academy. It's all there. It's all there, um, you know, from the, the trials and tribulations of trying to, you know, secure more money for clothing and this and that. I mean, it's all there. It's amazing as a federal project. There's so much written about this. And yeah. of course, I have a Facebook page saying, Talk to Academy. Uh, if you go through the post, you can kind of see that the entire you know progress of, of my restoration effort. Yeah, we re last year before COVID, we did a research trip to Gilcrease, and the Peter Pitchland papers have letters, mm -hmm. and then there is yeah a lot of letters that just go all through it about the Choctaw Academy, and um, then there is a book, and I didn't bring it with me. Isn't in there, <laughs> and it's just correspondence, and it's every bit of like three quarters of an inch thick, just correspondence about. Uh, yeah, great. This, this is so good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is this is the 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 book in my or the the yellow book here is Christina Snyder's book that was published, I think, in two thousand sixteen or seventeen. Um, I did a book fair with her about this book. Um, this this is a really good. I mean, it's everything about the Choctaw Academy. And of course, this, I don't think it actually was published, but Schools for the Choctaws uh, has an entire chapter dedicated to the Choctaw Academy. Oh, okay. That's good to hear. <laughs> Do you want to read that question while I get this? Did we get a question? Yes. Um, let's see. Unfortunately, I unfortunately have to drop off. Thank you for your work. And the update, I will continue to follow. Can I ask a question? Yes. Do you feel the Choctaw Academy led to the Choctaw people requesting a college fund be established under the terms of their treaty with the federal government? Ooh, that's a good one for Ian. So Ian, yes. I knew when when Peter Pitchland brought education back to the um, to Oklahoma, I'm sure there were there were a lot of federal monies uh, discussed, I think, in the mid 1800s, but I don't know much about that. I do remember reading a little. What was the story there for education after? Well, you know, the story for education actually goes back a, a little bit before, you know, Choctaws requested that missionaries come into Choctaw Nation. I think it was 1818, 1819, something like that and set up schools. And the main reason, at least at that point, was not so much missionization as to have education, learning how to speak English, learning how to read and write and that kind of thing. So the, the Choctaw Academy plays into that broader story. Um, in, terms of, in terms of Choctaw Academy, did it lead to Choctaw people requesting college funds? I think that was already the idea in treaties before that. Um, Choctaw Academy, you know, Choctaw started attending in 1825. There was only one more treaty after that, the Treaty of Dancing Rabbit Creek. So the, the precedent of using treaties as a means for obtaining education funds was already set before that. Uh, one, one point just to help contextualize, however, the importance of education that Choctaw leaders had, you know, Choctaw Chief Allen Wright, the same guy who named Oklahoma, said, educate, educate or else we perish. And he was um, he was in a, a various positions of authority within the Choctaw government in the mid-1800s. And the Choctaw Tribal Council in the 1840s 
set up a, a full public school education system in Indian Territory. Uh, it was one of the most extensive, one of the most progressive educational systems in what became the United States at that time. Uh, there were educational opportunities, not just for Choctaw males, but Choctaw females. Um, for people of African heritage, there were schools that Choctaw Nation set up as well. So the, the Choctaw Academy plays into that, but I don't think it's just solely because of the Choctaw Academy. It's, it's a broader picture. That's very good. And uh, also, too, if if um, if any of the viewers, you know, either today or, you know, uh, on a recording, I uh, want to, uh, you know, communicate with me about, you know, helping with the restoration, you can message through the Save the Choctaw Academy Facebook page. Good to know. Thank you. And hopefully at that time, I'll have a I'll have a fiscal agent. So, you know, the, those contributions can be tax deductible. That would be beautiful. All right, anything else to add, Francine? No, just that I do think, um, Chip, you're wise to get a different, you know, 501c3 other than your own. Because in my experience, sometimes the 501c3 gets attached to the person. Yeah. And yeah. you want this to go on forever. So. <laughs> well, there's, yeah. there's, there's so many, there's so many, good 501 organizations that are already built around historic preservation. Yeah. Uh, we just need one of those to, you know, you know, Step forward. put their, put their legal team where their mouth is and, and, uh, you know, help, help push it along. Um, I, I have no problems at all, whether it's a, a national historic trust, of course, there was a nice article about the Choctaw Academy in, in, in their magazine or a local historic trust or, any kind of humanities based organization, you know, if they want to also be involved in, in, in you know, some decision making for the restoration, I'm okay with that. This isn't the Dr. Richardson show. This is the, this is the Choctaw Nation show. And um, as long as we tell the story in a way that reflects, um, you know, the opinions and, and the, the beliefs of the Choctaw Nation, um, I'm, I'm here to support it. Very good. And thank you for all you've done. I, I appreciate you guys having me and, and uh, being able to tell the story. Thank you both. I, I appreciate your knowledge and, and the work that you've done. At this point, I'm going to hand it officially back to Megan. Awesome. Thanks everyone for watching. Um, I just wanted to, um, a Peggy Faulkner is here and she says that her great, great grandfather graduated from their school. So you have multiple descendants of yes. Choctaw Academy kind of watching and learning today. Um, so thank you, Dr. Chip. Thanks, Francine and Ian, for um, this chat to Sholi and sharing your knowledge and experiences with our community members. Um, so our next chat to Sholi event will be Thursday, July 22nd at 1 p.m. 1 p.m. Um, we'll be hosting LaDonna Brown, the Director of Research and Cultural Interpretation at the Chickasaw Nation. Her talk is going to be about the relationship between Choctaws and Chickasaws. Um, so That'll be our next one. It'll be this month. Um, so that's kind of it. Chippewa Chiki, everyone. Awesome. Chippewa Chiki.